my network. Um, I have a little private blog called Sea Net Packets uh, where I discuss some FCs. Uh, but now I want to uh, talk about microburst. I found them in real world case by myself. And the undertitle is Why Massive Packet Loss Can Occur at Low Bandwidth Usage. Okay, we start. Yeah. Uh, I will show you the problem, but we won't analyzing the problem and I will demonstrate how we find microbursts and after that I will show some typical microburst scenarios and at the end I will present a summary and a Q&A. So, the problem. If we have a normal Ethernet network with a lot of peer-to-peer -peer communication and 1% bandwidth is used, no problem, as we expected. But what will happen if we change our application structure? If we talk with a lot of clients to a focal point, it's a hierarchical network, and we still use 1% bandwidth of a fast Ethernet. Network. It doesn't matter uh, the size of the network or the bandwidth, it could be in a 10 gigabit network also, but it's more easy to explain it in a fast internet network because the case was there. And uh, we will see that it's more fascinating that it could occur in every network. So, so. This was our uh, network application, yes. And we want to know how much data is the application able to handle. It was a performance test. We, for that kind of analysis, we um, go, in our, go into our lab and define our network in one switch. Okay, one switch with fast Ethernet and the backplane is not the problem, the switch has full wire speed switching capacity. Okay? We, in every port, we stuck uh, some um, traffic generators, application based traffic generators, and to one destination port. So we expected an amount of 1,000 devices could be handled by the application. But then we began to wonder at the half of the expected traffic, means 500 clients, yeah, we got massive packet loss. So the application began to handle the end devices begin to terminate the sessions. So massive packet loss began. And the use bandwidth is still below 1 Mbit and 100 Mbit network. Yeah. <clears throat> and the switch does not show any drops. Um, who's to blame now? The application, the clients, the switch, the network. So, I'm a network engineer. Of course, the application. Eh? <laughs> no, we will see. No, uh, we capture for this uh, kind of analysis the traffic at the point marked with the oh, oh. at. Uh, at here we capture and we capture here and here. Okay? We see massive packet loss in the trace with a, with a flag, with a red flag. At the red flag capture point we see massive packet loss. <coughs> and the 
imagine <laughs> traffic is still below one ampere. But we see, we have seen that the traffic was not flat. The traffic was comes in bursts. Yes. So the switch counters uh, does not tell the truth. So okay. Why do we see this method? Yeah, the switch counter does not tell you the truth is what is an issue. Yeah. The switch vendor or the switch manufacturer told us that there was packet loss in the switch, but the switch counter does not count. So interesting. <laughs> yeah. So let's have a look how the frames are transmitted over the network. When we have a frame, the smallest gap between the two frames is one frame and an inter-frame gap of 69, uh, 96, 5 bits. And then the next frame may come. <coughs> how fast a bit is transmitted over the network? depends on the speed of the network itself. So one gigabit is 10 times faster than 100 Mbit. And that's the interesting fact that we must know. Not the um, average amount of traffic is the, the maximum benefits we can use. Yeah? The time between each train is the maximum bandwidth we are, have available. So if we have um, between, uh, between two frames a gap of 150 bits or bytes, we can't put in a frame with 1,500 bytes, even if these are our only one frames in the, in the whole second. Yes. There's no gap for the large frame, so we have at this moment our uh, wire is full. Okay, for this we can look, have a closer look. I have made a frame gap calculator for this kind. Hope we can see. Yeah. So, yeah, if, uh, we can see uh, we can see different uh, network speeds. I have uh, 10 Mbit, 100 Mbit, 1 Gigabit, and 10 Gigabit. The bit, we can see here the bit transmit times and the frame sizes. Here's the inter-frame gap, this is fixed, yes, and uh, the Bit sum of the I will the bit sum is the, the frame and the interframe gap. That is our frame gap for a frame on the network. And if these bits, the frame and the interframe gap, are transmitted, then we get our minimum delta time between two frames. Also uh, just for knowing, I will show you here how much frames can be transmitted in a second. So, the green fields are the yeah, ones we can edit. Yeah. Yes? Shouldn't it be 10,000 below the left field instead of 100? I think you are right. Too much intelligence in the sheet. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We start with a with a 10 Mbit, yeah, and we have a large frame size, fully Ethernet frame length, and we have a time between two frames of um, one million 
200,000 nanoseconds. Okay, quite large gap. And we can transmit 827 frames per second. Yeah, not much. So, but if it's quite interesting, if we go to 64 bytes, the minimum bytes, yes, we have only a 60,000 nanosecond frame gap, a uh, minimum between two frames, yeah. the next frame after the other. And we can transmit 16,000 frames in a second. So what, we, what I want to show here is that we can see that we can um, see that the, the time between two frames which are transmitted is 10 times faster, as I told, from 10 Mbit network to the 100 Mbit network. Yes. And quite interesting, it's a side effect, yeah, if we go here for 64 bits, yeah, 64 bytes, sorry, um, the switching device, yeah, which should switch every frame, must do much more work with small frames than with large frames, yes. For example, that was why I um, made it customizable. Here, yeah, one gigabit, for example, it's quite interesting, one gigabit. If we go to large frames, we can see that the small frames we can have 1,600,000 frames per second and with the large frames we only have 28,000, 82,000 frames per second. Yeah. That um, is what some switches it's a performance test for switches, yes. Small frames. Yeah. Um, if you uh, have um, some network cards, they, if you reduce the frame size, often the CPU usage goes up yeah, for the um, <coughs> PC. So. Yeah, that's what I want to show, and uh, what we see here, what our um, problem was, was 155, 155 bytes was our frame. So, and we see with uh, our frame gap between two frames is in the fast Ethernet um, 13 microseconds. Yeah. And um, if you go under 13 microseconds, then you have a problem. And that could happen, as I told you, with three frames. So, yeah, I have a practical demonstration. <laughs> Second one. Oh, sorry, that's not what I want to show. So, here. I have a I've made a trace, yes. Um, with uh, UDP packets, one direction, one easy thing. Yeah? Okay, I have uh, made a data column. No, absolute from, uh, from the start of the capture. Okay. We see not much, but if you go to the statistics, IO graph, then we see it was uh, in my home network, made in my home <coughs> network, one gigabit link, yeah, one ambit traffic. Yeah, no problem here. One ambit here, one ambit here. But what happens if we go to 100 milliseconds? So, we see still one embed on this side, and we see, <coughs> I guess, sorry for that. I have to 
for we start here. So okay, it's <laughs> better. Um, so I one one ended here. The the problem uh, was that I was on uh, on packets, not on bits. Yeah, now I'm on bits. So if we go to 100 milliseconds, we see here what I saw. Still one ended here, but here are we at. Um, Still at one Mbit here, but uh, for 100 um, milliseconds, which means we have um, <coughs> 12 Mbit, and it goes up in 10 megabits. Yeah, still one Mbit at 10 millisecond resolution. Yes, that's um, the same. We have um, here still one ambit, yes, one ambit, so we can zoom in and you see that um, still one ambit here, but here the traffic looks really, really different. Yeah. So, um, if you go to one ambit, uh, one uh, millisecond, then it's clear. Here's still one ambit, but when we see here, we are at 3,000 um, bits per millisecond, which means we have, in real, we have 300 ambit traffic per millisecond. Yeah? 300 ambit millis uh, traffic per millisecond. And um, that's what I uh, want to sh that's what called microburst. That's microburst. We have uh, in the average resolution, resolution, if you only look at the average traffic, we see at both um, traffic waves one ambit. So no problem. But at the later one, I will go back. <coughs> but at this one, we potentially have the risk of massive packet loss. Yes. And this, I will bring some scenarios where it could occur. And that was the problem in my case. Yes, we got um, distributed traffic. The friends came from different ports at the same time and makes a microburst. Yes. So you always have to look <coughs> deeper in the when you have packet loss and can't explain it sometimes. Yeah? You have to look how are the delta of the friends. Yes. So I want to show you um, this is um, quite nice with Wireshark, but uh, sometimes if you have more than one ambit traffic, yes, it's um, not, um, if you will go to this resolution, yeah, the peaks are really huge. Yeah? And um, sometimes it's um, the border of Wireshark. So, but there's a nice tool, Packet Analyzer, and they have built-in functions. So here's our bandwidth, normal, over seconds. Yeah? The same graph like in Wireshark. But there's a second um, graphic, which called microburst. And we have a resolution microburst, burst interval of um, one millisecond burst interval. And we can see here that in the first uh, graph we have one megabit burst interval. Very calm, very. And in the second we have expected it, our 300 megabit. But this graph shows us. And it shows us the maximum peaks of a second by a millisecond resolution. This means the 
the graph looks, splits the seconds in milliseconds, and prints out the, the largest peak of a millisecond of that period second. Yes, and I like this graph. <laughs> you can see some interesting things. Yes, um, I have uh, here some from Q&A, Wireshark, some example traces here. Yeah. You can see uh, here peaks, yes, and then goes traffic down. This burst, this only burst view, yeah. But often if you get such uh, um, low, lower, um, low peak, yes, um, there's a problem. Often there's packet loss. There is a retransmission or something else. Yes. So this microburst analysis um, is, for me, interesting part here yeah, to find what I have to dig deeper into the trace. Yes, sometimes or I get the uh, Jasper had told double check your findings. Yes, the microburst analysis can make you a double checking feature. Why do we double check the feature? So, um, this is what I want to show you with uh, packet analyzer. Um, so, so, here we have a uh, scenario line by. As we have seen, integrating its network with different bandwidths. So the SLA for a band for one uh, line is often defined in 10 Mbit per second. Yes. But what will so in this case, yeah. But what will happen with our SLA if this happens? If we uh, put the 10 Mbits in half of a second um, on the wire. Mostly, I can't say. <laughs> it depends, <laughs> it really depends. Yeah? Some vendors uh, or some uh, ISPs can handle this, other ISP not. Depends really on the ISP. Not wondering if there is packet loss on the bottom. So we have uh, some mitigations for that. Um, be prepared if you are in, um, negotiating your SLI. Yeah, know your application. Baselining, yeah. Know what you have for uh, um, application behavior. Is your application bursty? Is it not bursty? So the ISP can say, okay, 10 mbit per second, and you say, okay, I have only 10 mbit per second. Both are right, yes. But um, um, if you are if you really handle this, you should um, talk about it while you're negotiating the SLA. The mitigation is also you can use large buffers on the uh, routers. Yes. But be careful. Yeah? The uh, risk of overload is also there. So the, what means buffer bloat? Buffer bloat means uh, if you buffer the traffic, then you uh, are able to, to get gaps in your traffic, huge gaps, yeah, because um, the traffic comes and must wait, and then you get uh, large uh, latencies in your traffic. So it's always uh, tuning is always. Um, your fingers must be so fine tuning. Yeah? Also, you must always be careful when you are tuning. It could be some, it 
could be possible that it goes in the wrong direction. Um, you also can implement some quality of service policies for the traffic. So that at least your um, most important traffic can make it over the one. Um, but packet loss cannot be uh, avoided with Q QS. Yeah? Only you can prioritize the traffic. Yeah? You can say, okay, my most important <coughs> application must go over the bar. Link. Okay, you all, <laughs> as, we can, as we have seen, okay, you can uh, upscale your one <laughs> uh, link. Um, that's all, always possible, yeah, but it's expensive too. Um, and you can try to avoid microverse. Maybe it's a not well-known um, application we have failure, yeah, but you can make some tuning mechanisms in your application that this microverse does not work you. Yeah. It's always possible, yes. Um, In the past, so we have scenario land now. In the past, we have had here yeah, 10 Mbit links normally, and um, oops, so for the for the access layer, and the distribution layer was typical 100 Mbit, and the core layer was 1 gigabit. So. What we have uh, learned so far is that no, or the risk of microburst was not really there. It was there, but it was at a minimum. So why was it so? Because we have seen that 10, 100 Mbit is able to transmit 10 more frames than 10 Mbit. Yeah. So, if we summarize here traffic from that layer, we can summarize 10 more uh, devices, 10, 10 times more devices, just because we have the benefit of 10 times more speed. The transmission time is higher. Also the same in the core layer from distribution to core. So we have perfect uh, architecture, yeah. which prevents us for microburst. And I think that's the reason why we <coughs> haven't dealt in the past so often with microburst. Um, nowadays, it's totally different. The most access layers have one gigabit. And the distribution layer is often one gigabit too. And the core layer is 10 gigabit. But even if it's not so, even if we are an enterprise company and we have here one gigabit, okay, then we have here 10 gigabit, but here we have 10 gigabit too. So, um, we have no benefit with the scaling from the transmission speed. Yeah? We just can do here some, uh, some, some tries to, to uh, double the lines and making the lines bigger with either channels or something else. But, in fact, we don't have the benefit like the past days with, uh, with natural transmission, transmission speed up. So um, our frames are transmitted at the same speed here and here, in my example. Yeah. And that makes it uh, really easy to happen a microburst because 
when you think um, that a microburst, of course, yeah, of course, a microburst does not happen uh, with one device. Yeah. If you only had one device, so there's a problem. The problem does occur here. It's um, if you have 100 devices in the excess layer, then it could occur that these devices are talking at the same time, yeah? even if they have low bandwidth consumption. And if they do so, then we got the problem with our interframe gap, that the interframe gap is not large enough. Yeah? And as I told you, in the past there was a gap, a natural gap. Yeah? And they come here with 100 frames at the same time, or 10 frames at the same time, then we get an automatically larger frame gap here on this link through this architecture. This benefit we don't have these days. Yeah. So what we can do, as you see, uh, we can double this line so that we are able to transport nearly the the whole capacity to the above layer. <coughs> and um, this, um, in the core layer, we have the same uh, problem that if in the distribution layer, we come to frames, uh, we should use 10 gigabit. If you have at all layers the same uh, transmission speed, then we uh, must not worry if you have if you see packet loss here somewhere to some point in that today. Hmm. So what I can say here is. Uh, For LAN, we can do that some switches are allow, uh, some switches allow the user to configure even on a one gigabit link, uh, 100 Mbit automatic. Yeah, this, uh, this is. Question. Yeah, what, what kind of uh, switching were you doing? Were cut through or uh, store forward? Uh, store forward. Uh, okay. The cut through, you don't have the issue. Hmm? The cut through switch, you, are, you, you don't have the issue. Right? Mm -hmm. The cut through will not work if you have speed differences. <laughs> yeah, if you have speed differences, you can cut through. As soon as they say you don't have speed conversions. Yeah, if you don't have speed differences, only if you have speed differences. But if you have, you can make up the taxes now and have to cut them. What? Uh, here? Okay. Yeah. It's 1-1 and 10-10, right? 1-1 and 10-10? Although, yeah, 1-1, one, one, here's uh, 1 gigabit and here's 1 gigabit, yeah. Yeah, but, but the problem, if I have stored forward or if I have cut through, does uh, not occur or does not, doesn't matter. Because uh, I say that not, you don't have, it's, it's not, High level picture, okay? It's not the real world, yeah? We have, I think, uh, here 10 times switches here, yeah? 10 times more switches here. And um, so this means here are 100 devices, I say, yeah? So, and 100 devices uh, go um, at the same time to the uplink. So what's the difference between store and forward and cut through? Yeah, so the frame gap. Many to one, right? Hmm? Your application is many to one, no? Many to one, yeah. yes, normal. Oh, it's not your, my application, it's uh, normal. So that's the normal Cisco architecture, I say. And here's your, uh, normally your uh, data center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so 
you should see the frame drops on the switch. Yes, I should see the frame drops on the switch, but okay, I was too fast. <laughs> the switch man, uh, manufacturer does not show, does, does not count. It was an issue. They, they had the counters, yeah, and they told me, hmm, we are not filling the counters. Interesting, eh? It was no cheap switch. Yeah. I was <laughs> uh, for okay, okay, it's for industrial environment, but um, no, I was very, very impressed that they uh, the, that they don't show us the the, the frame drops and the counters. Yes, of course. Normally, in a normal switch, we expect output drops. Yes. And then the analyze would be more easier. But in fact, we we we, we must um, see the difference. Yeah. Here we are talking about uh, drops because of um, small frame gaps. Because bandwidth is full and at a millisecond. Yeah? In a millisecond, the bandwidth is full and may be buffered, but must not. Another problem why a switch can drop frames is just because it's full. Yeah? The, in, in, the switch has two values, the port capacity and the backlink switching capacity. Yes. And in, someday, sometimes, you have packet drops on the switch because the switch is nearly full and the back line does not, uh, cannot handle the amount of traffic. Also. So, but this was not the case, yes, uh, normally. So, um, we had, in fact, we had more bandwidth, we wanted more bandwidth to use than the 100 Mbit but just in one millisecond. So, I go back to the um, mitigations. Yeah. Um, I will uh, I'll talk that, okay, uh, the thumb switch uh, manufacturers, I know it from HP, uh, allow 100 megabit auto negotiation. Co uh, configuration on the port. Yeah. Um, Cisco does not. Cisco would just say uh, alternate yes or no. Yeah. But uh, HP is for uh, this value. Um, quite, I haven't tested it really, but it really works with every device. Yeah. Um, Um, uplinks needs more. Yeah. Okay, uplinks needs more bandwidth than the downlink port. So, the uh, actual best practice recommendation is uh, using the um, use of Ether channels and half of the switching capacity to. Um, put in the ether channel. Yeah. So if you have a 24 gigabit switch, then you need, I say, 10 gigabit uplink to the distribution there. Yeah. Of course, we, all, we also can use quality of service yeah, with uh, traffic prioritization, but again, payload loss cannot be avoided. Okay, we have a third scenario, industrial Ethernet. Industrial Ethernet is a little bit different. Uh, industrial Ethernet always, nearly always have hierarchical communication. Here's uh, one controller, uh, one uh, PLC programmable programming logic controller. And here are some I.O. devices. 
this. So, um, and these devices want to talk with the controller. Uh, typical is a, a car manufacturer, and here are the, uh, the robots or something. Yeah. Every device must communicate with the controller. If the communication fails here, the I/O device goes offline. Yeah. Off. They go into a, a fail safe state. Yes. They have all these small packets. And they have a short communication interval. It's up to milliseconds, yes. Sometimes. Yes. Depends on the on the um, need. Yeah. They can go up to 300 milliseconds, I know, but they can do one millisecond or less, yes. And um, as I told you, peg loss will not be tolerated often. Uh, also, they use Profinet for this kind of application. But if you have uh, another scenario of the industry, then it sometimes it's UDP is used with own protocols by the manufacturer. I know uh, especially interlocking environments, yeah, they, are, they are using their own protocols. And also there are, I know, three packets are lost, the device goes off communication sometimes, yes. Three packets lost. But they must uh, be lost uh, in chain. So what we can do here is um, awful for the backbone. We are a bit up yeah. So this means that here, okay, it's all this fast, both fast Ethernet. So if we can here, here, here use gigabit, we have. Uh, Mitigate a good mitigation for our issue. Yeah. Um, and also, we have um, we have the possibility. That's interesting. Yeah, in the industrial uh, environment, we have the possibility of real time of the usage of real time protocols. Yes, like uh, Profinet. ERT, so it's a Cronus real time Profinet. Profinet uh, IRT provides us a special kind of uh, quality of service. Uh, you can say, okay, 50% of my uh, line is always for Profinet ERT, and you can define time slots when a packet arrives. Yeah. Uh, so the total chain of all devices has knows when the packet comes and transports the packets. Yes. But all devices must support this configuration. Yeah. One switch between and you can um, not configure it. So yeah, that's a special uh, use case of uh, industrial Ethernet usage, yeah. And <coughs> then that was what I wanted to show in the scenarios and here's my summary. Okay, um, we have seen that um, nowadays it's more common than in the past, yeah, because we have uh, often the same transmission speed at different layers in the network. Think about access layer and distribution layer. I think it's the most common uh, behavior where we have the same link speed. Yeah. Often core layer is 10 gigabit. Uh, in the industry environment, 
we have uh, sending speeds often. Um, not only the average amount of traffic is interesting, yeah, we can see that um, the average amount of traffic in every millisecond is interesting. And this is called microburst. If we have uh, in one millisecond this, a peak of 300 MBit, then it's our microburst. Yeah. At Uplink or Warnhaus, you should keep an eye at that microburst. Um, I told it here, um, and I'm, it's a real world example. Yeah, I know an inter enterprise company which. Uh, has problems with this kind of SLAs. One ISP may handle it, <coughs> and another ISP does not. Yeah. So it's an actual problem. And <clears throat> the number of packets is a side effect. It's also interesting when we look at the network performance, because every uh, uh, switch um, consumes more CPU usage when he has to deal with small packets than with large packets because store and forward. Okay, by cut through not, yes. By store and forward the packet will problem. By cut through too, but not so. Um, <coughs> I say for that kind of analysis uh, we have seen that uh, the frame gap is really is minimum at 10 gigabit links. Yeah, uh, if you want to do it really, then you need precise capture equipment yeah. with uh, time stamping capture cards and um, not. Um, I've seen sometimes uh, Wireshark. We have done the traces with Wireshark. Yeah, I must say. Uh, T Shark and TCP Jump are better, but with Wireshark, not wondering if there's a 300 millisecond gap in the trace. Just from uh, TCP Jump through the GUI to the uh, capture. We have seen really 300 millisecond gaps, and for that kind, uh, 300 millisecond gaps, you don't need a microburst analysis. Yes, uh, it's not nothing worth So, precise capture equipment. So, okay, <laughs> I think it's a little, little bit early. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, I just wanted to point a couple things out. Um, I'm going to take off my Wireshark hat and drop my riverbed hat for a second. The packet analyzer that Christian showed, if you go to Wireshark.org, there's, if you scroll down, you can get it for 29 bucks. So why wouldn't you? Read my question. It's a pretty cool tool for that price, so check it out. The store and forward, cut through, it doesn't matter, microburst happens. And uh, the other thing, Christian, is um, if you have a 2016 server with Windows 10, you're going to have microburst, guaranteed, with file transfer. Because Windows size is 2 billion. So your network is going to get 2 billion uh, bytes worth of data as fast as possible with fast out files, fast servers. So, but don't go crazy, because if you look for Microsoft, micro bits, no, microburst everywhere, you'll see it, but you know, the fast we test it. And then the other one is um, the interframe gap time uh, and the, is uh, historic thing. So be careful. In my session, I showed you that link where you can look at the interrupt. Um, so a lot of times, people will try to cheat by not using IF interframe gap time because that happened when the network was 10 megabit, 1 megabit, and the network cards needed to update registers. And, and uh, so that's why it was there for house cleaning purposes. Now, not so much, but it can lead to unintended consequences. So be careful um, if the driver says, oh, we reduce that trade gap kind of thing. So, especially in the financials, it could lead to disastrous um, unintended consequences. Yeah, I think the interesting thing with the data framework while I was uh, preparing the session is it's still 96 bytes, yes, and that means, okay, in the early days we need it, and now we have it, yes. Yeah, and um, of course, uh, so packet analyzer is a uh, great tool. I love it. <laughs> it's the problem. It has, by the way, it has really the best Wireshark integration 
like the Russian tools that I know. Yes. <laughs> for, for that kind, and uh, it's on the Wireshark page, I won't provide it here. But uh, my goodness. Are there any questions further? So I just can say the, the one problem, yeah, that would be the most uh, common problem which could occur. Where would they can help with that too? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but uh, that's a problem, yes, uh, at one means, yeah, because we have this massive, uh, um, we go, we come from one gigabit, yeah, and go to 10 gigabit. Also, yeah. As we have seen with the uh, Franker calculator, yeah, there, there must be a problem. Yeah. So, yes, I uh, put my Franker calculator into the presentation, so I think uh, you can see it. Okay. Retrospective.